Welcome to Electrified, it's your host, Dylan Loomis. Not a Tesla app put out a new article talking about Tesla's upcoming FSD version 14, and they made it seem as if they had some new information, but I'm not so sure. They said the standout feature of version 14 will be these auto regressive transformers. But as far as I know, Tesla has been using this type of transformer now for some time. To verify that, if you go to the Q4 transcript from last year, Elon said, I have to say, I continue to be amazed by just how effective auto regressive transformers are at solving a wide range of problems. And no, auto-aggressive is not a thing they meant regressive. As I understand it, think about these ARTs allowing for better predictions. So they'll use the context of the current scene, whether it's people, dogs, bikes, and from there it helps you to predict the specific path for each object. For the audience, a transformer is a very popular, more recent structure of AI that's now used in a huge number of the tools that you've seen. The reason that they're popular is because transformers are structured in a way that helps them pay attention to key bits of information and give much better results. You could build chips that are perfectly suited for just one kind of AI model. But if you do that, then you're making them less able to do other things. So no, I don't think these regressive transformers are anything new for version 14. And then they just went on to talk about the context size, which kind of serves as memory, which should be increased with version 14. There was some breaking news as I was recording. If you search for bot and manufacturing on the Tesla careers page, you will now find 18 job postings for the Tesla bot all in manufacturing, some in Sparks, Nevada, some in Fremont, and some in Palo Alto. Tesla's looking for manufacturing engineers, production supervisors, manufacturing equipment engineers, quality engineers, and a technical program manager for battery manufacturing specifically for the Tesla bot. For the manufacturing control engineer, they'll deliver new manufacturing lines to produce powertrains energy products and Optimus battery and actuators at Tesla factories. This role is directly responsible for the design and implementation of these manufacturing lines. What you'll do, design and launch manufacturing equipment for new products being mass produced for the first time. So I think it's one thing to be told that Tesla is starting production later this year, but it's a different thing to actually see some of the job postings and understand this really is going to happen. So of course, this is incredibly exciting as Elon has reiterated that long-term Optimus will be the majority of Tesla stock valuation. And to have an American company manufacturing one of the first commercial humanoids at scale in America is something that everybody who works at Tesla should be incredibly proud of. Plenty of work ahead, but the pieces are being put in place. Elon is set to meet with Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, next week as he was invited to the US by Trump. Discussions are expected to focus on Tesla's expansion and collaboration with the Indian Space Research Organization with an eye on growing the EV market. Sources are already saying these talks may boost relations, but they may not lead to an immediate announcement or commitment regarding Tesla's manufacturing plans in India. Despite this, sources still indicate Tesla remains keen on entering the Indian market and continues to explore various options. They did talk about Tesla's more affordable upcoming vehicle, the one we don't yet know much about. They said the expectation is that model could enter the Indian market by 2025. In preparation for that, Tesla has been scouting locations for company-owned showrooms across India. But when it comes to local manufacturing in India, it may still be a while for an announcement like that. Tesla's mega factory in Shanghai is set to officially begin production roughly one week from now on February 11th. Tesla's also planning to hold a ceremony to mark the factory's official start of production. As far as we know, CATL is set to be the main supplier and the nameplate capacity is still 40 gigawatt hours, but I would not be surprised if that number is exceeded at some point in the future based on the size of the factory. And the CNEV post did say this factory mainly produces the mega pack, at least cracking the door open for power wall production there as well. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley did an interview with the director of vehicle engineering for the 3 and Y and the Model Y program manager. I learned a fair bit of new information from this conversation, so here it is. The Model Y now has its own design more distinct from the Model 3 because with its scale, it can now develop its own supply chain. Thus, Tesla 
doesn't have to be as focused on making sure the three and the Y use as many parts that are the same as possible. Tesla's keeping the existing blue color in North America for now, but they're working on new colors and they said there will be an announcement soon. The Tesla logo or the badge being only on the vehicles in China was strictly because of the homologation rules in China. Tesla did not want that front badge in any market, they just want the design to speak for itself. The new official EPA results are in and the range on the new Model Y will be 5% better than the outgoing model, which would mean going from 311 miles on the outgoing version to 327. Per the usual, Tesla achieved that 5% by improving efficiencies basically everywhere in the vehicle, but one notable change was the brake calipers with the new Model Y. It does have the same suspension as the Model 3 with the frequency selective dampers, and they have new braces for increased stiffness to improve the NVH and ride comfort. Tesla has yet another new in-house design, this time for the door latch system on the Model 3 that was also carried over to the Model Y, but prior to the new Model 3, they actually got that part from suppliers. The new Model Y will have a better, quieter trunk close because it now has two power struts, whereas the outgoing model had a passive strut on the right-hand side. Tesla now has the fastest folding seats in the second row in the industry. The standard is about seven seconds for that function, but Tesla got it down to 4.5 seconds. And guess what? They did that by developing a bespoke gearbox in-house to enable this. So again, Tesla could have just accepted the industry standard, but they decided to design a new gearbox in-house. The reason the new Model Y gets the front bumper camera and not the Model 3 is because the Y is a bigger vehicle and it has a bigger blind spot for the front and the hood area of the vehicle. So that camera is specifically for actually smart summon. It sounds like the Model 3 will not be getting that camera because the blind spot in the front is not as big as the Y in the Cybertruck. They moved the rear seat belts forward a bit to make it easier to reach back. And I think this next one is awesome and goes way overlooked. So it's a new in-cabin radar to detect and classify passengers. And in Q3 of this year, that new radar will allow second row detection. So it can detect somebody's heart rate and breathing in the vehicle. So if a child is left in the back seat, it can notify the owner, it can turn on the HVAC, it can open the windows. And listen to how excited they were about this one. Yeah, this is one of these technologies that Tesla's just like blown up the industry on. It's, it's not, not as well known as maybe some of the other ones, but it absolutely is because like there is a system within cars that tries to detect how big a person is in order to fine tune the airbags and how they deploy and how they react to the occupant. And it's, it's moderately accurate, but with this system here, we got it exact. So it'll give us another lever to be able to further improve our airbag deployments and our safety restraint systems to go even further in terms of like being able to um, protect our occupants based on their size and their, their ergonomics. So a new 4D imaging radar that already offers improved safety and later this year will offer even more safety features as well. The new Model Y has oscillating air vents. So think just like a fan so you can have the air moving back and forth. They said the HEPA filter in Tesla vehicles are still underrated in terms of size. It's a massive industry leading feature. And they said the build quality is now as good as anything in the world through continuous iteration. I will have the full video linked below. Lawmakers in South Carolina are considering a new law that would finally allow direct to consumer EV sales. But it's not because of Tesla and it's the right thing to do. It's actually because of Scout Motors trying to take the Tesla approach and Scout Motors has a $2 billion factory planned for South Carolina. So yes, if this law does not change, that would mean the roughly 4,000 workers at this new Scout factory would have to travel to neighboring states to buy the vehicles they build in the state. As you would expect, many dealer groups and associations are already pushing back significantly against this bill. If you wanna follow it, this one is called the South Carolina Consumer Freedom Act. Right now, we have about 30 Toyota and Lexus dealers from across the US descending on Capitol Hill in an attempt to avoid what they're calling onerous and disruptive state level mandates that are set to go into effect in six states later this fall. Yes, these are the states that decided to follow California 
Virginia's lead. I will say though, based on current EV sales, the bar is pretty high. That's set to go into effect later this year. They're looking for 35% EV sales. And this starting with the 2026 model year. The first round of states, California, Oregon, Washington, New York, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Given that EV adoption in California, the bellwether for the United States was well under 30% in quarter four. I'm pretty sure these other states have close to a 0% chance of hitting these targets within the next 12 months. So if nothing changes, then yes, these automakers would likely be looking to buy some credits and the most likely seller would be Tesla. We got more of the same for Ford when it comes to its EV division. They're now delaying future models and not only that, but they're scaling back the plans for the production numbers. The second gen F-150 EV, which may or may not be called the Lightning, has now been delayed until 2027. And now they're expecting less than 100,000 next gen F-150 EV pickups, which is a third of the previously planned output of 300,000 per year. We also got Ford's Q4 earnings and its EV division Model E lost $5.1 billion for 2024. When it comes to those potential 25% tariffs, Farley just said it would have a huge impact on our industry with billions of dollars of industry profits wiped out and adverse effect on the US jobs. And when it comes to guidance for Ford's Model E division, EBIT earnings before interest and taxes for 2025, they're looking at another five to $5.5 billion loss for the year. If you take Ford's quarter four Model E loss of about $1.39 billion and divide that by 37,000 wholesale units for Q4, that means Ford lost about $37,500 per car in Q4. And running the same calculation for quarter four of 2023, that works out to a loss of about $46,000 per vehicle. So almost a $10,000 improvement in terms of loss per vehicle over the past year. But the truth is Ford's Model E division faces a very bleak 2025 and 2026 until they have those more affordable models ready. And by that time, I would just say Ford better be knocking those out of the park. Ford is still working on these extended range EVs that have a small combustion engine to recharge the battery on board. It's the end of an era this week as Sawyer highlighted the old Model Y has been removed from the Chinese configurator. And in an attempt to generate more Model 3 sales in China, they're offering about $1,100 in that insurance subsidy yet again for Model 3 buyers. Nissan has decided to suspend talks with Honda when it comes to them working together to form that joint holding company. The companies were not able to agree on the valuation of each side. They did say that we plan to establish a direction and make an announcement around mid-February. According to Tesla's website, Mercedes should now have access to the supercharger network, but right now it's only in the US and not yet in Canada. Mercedes owners still need to buy an adapter as they won't have the native NAX port until later in 2025. Plus, these Mercedes vehicles will need a dealership installed software software update, it cannot be done remotely. Mercedes has sold between 35 and 45,000 EVs in the US across the past two years. Omar shared a screenshot showing Tesla sending out some new free FSD trials. And from Nicholas on X, it sounds like ABB has reopened its doors to Tesla for use as company vehicles. ABB said our conclusion was that Tesla's employment conditions are sufficiently good, meaning they're comparable to or better than the relevant relevant collective agreements. Therefore, Tesla has been conditionally approved, meaning we resume the possibility of ordering Tesla as a company car. ABB's fleet is probably only about 10,000 around the world, but they do have a goal of going all electric by 2030. There are plenty of headlines today about Tesla's sales plunging in Germany, but they're only talking about one month of January. And remember, Tesla is in the midst of a massive changeover to the new Model Y, so sales are definitely going to be down throughout quarter one. And yes, there's likely some political things taking place here as well, but we'll see how things shake out throughout quarter one. Some banks just wrapped up their sale of about $5.5 billion in debt backed by X. There turned out to be greater demand for this debt than many were expecting, but we learned something interesting. One, XAI has been transferring hundreds of millions of dollars to X to help fund the business. X now holds a 10% stake in XAI, which 
which is valued at about $5 billion. But listen to this, X told these investors that its EBITDA was $1.25 billion on annual revenue of 2.7 billion. In 2021, the last full year of Twitter before Elon took over, they did EBITDA of $682 million on about $5 billion in revenue. That means Elon has basically doubled the EBITDA number on half of the revenue. So it's true, X is still struggling to break even, but they've made significant progress from where things were just a few years ago. Tesla stock closed the day at $378.17, down 3.58%, while the NASDAQ was up 0.19%. The volume was 23% below the average. I hope you have a wonderful day. Please like the video. If you did, you can find me on X linked below. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.